Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here today. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, if you could please uh, identify yourself and spell your name and say your name, please. All right. Well, I'm Zvi Dershowitz, Z-V-I. D-E-R-S-H-O-W-I-T-Z, but frankly, on my passport, you'll find the name Hugo, H-U-G-O, instead of Tzvi. Tzvi is my Hebrew name, and that's what the world knows me at. So you mentioned your, your uh, passport and how you were born. So when and where were you born, and what was life like for you as a child? Well, I was born in what, is, what was then Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, by the way, the uh, New York Times today had an article that the Czech Republic wants to n is looking to change its name somehow to Czechia or something like that. But that's another story. I was born in 1928. That tells you that I'm a youngster. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, the life there was uh, good until things happened. All right, well, let's, before quickly we talk about when things happened, what was your favorite childhood memory? Childhood memory was that I had a wonderfully uh, rich family, and I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about uh, happy uh, life Jewishly, but also in sports, I used to play soccer. My parents sent me to ski when I was eight, years old in the Carpathian Mountains with a group of kids. I was the youngest of them, um, and a Jewish identity, the synagogue every, sh every week, and uh, very happy, very happy times. Okay, so now let's talk about the not-so-happy times. You did flee your country. How old were you when you fled? And tell me about the day your is the parents or both, or your grandparents told you your family had to move out of the country. Well, what I'm I'm going to tell you, I didn't know at the time. I found all this out later. All I know is that uh, uh, Hitler had already taken over Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia. We did not live in that part, uh, but certainly the Hitlerian uh, threat was all over. As a matter of fact, I lived in an apartment house on the third floor, and the roof was right above us, and the Czech government put anti-aircraft guns on the roof of my house, and I heard the boots, so we knew, and, and uh, it was a very democratic country, so the people who were Nazis were allowed, because freedom of speech, they were allowed to parade through the streets, uh, pro-Hitler, and freedom of speech, they were allowed to do that, even though the Czech people were very angry at it, the government said, no, this is a freedom to do. So we knew that something was coming, but we didn't know what was coming. And so then what were your tools when you had to leave? Did your grandparents tell you something? Or well, my, uh, later on I found out that, uh, look, anti-Semitism was uh, not new in, in Europe. And uh, my, uh, my parents, my father had come from Poland, which was then Austria-Hungarian Empire, uh, not very uh, friendly to Jews many times. So my grandfather apparently... I found this out later, called my dad and his brothers, all his kids together, and he said, look, this guy, Hitler, is, gotta be, is different from all the other anti-Semites, uh, and he, he advised them to leave. And we were well-to-do in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, and to, to leave was, that's impossible. How do you leave a beautiful country, a beautiful culture? You're well-to-do fiscally, but uh, they took their father's advice. And how did you feel when, you're, when you were told you had to leave them? Well, all I knew was that we were going to another place, America, and I was told, uh, I mean, I found out about a month or two before, I can't tell you exactly, and I was told not to say anything to anybody when the, when the house was being, you know, the apartment was being cleared out and the maids were gone. Uh, because we would be the laughing stock of everybody else. Why? What are you leaving? So what? Uh, we've handled anti-Semites before, uh, and uh, so we're told to keep silent and not to tell any of my friends. And interesting. And how old were you when you were told this? Well, uh, about ten, ten and a half. And 
Who did you leave behind? Everybody, everything. Your friends? Your... My grandparents uh, were too old to, to, to make the trip, but uh, uh, all my friends, I mean, I have a photograph someplace of all the kids in my class. You know, you take at the end of the school year, you always take pictures. Later on, a lot of research years later, I found out that only two of us survived. All the other kids in the class were murdered. Um, now that we've discussed who you left behind, let's discuss your journey to America. What was your journey to America? What were the steps it took to get to America? Yeah, yeah. Well, my parents got a legal visa to come to America even though Jews were not being given visas, especially Jews of Polish citizenship. My father had been, the Czechs never allowed my father to get Czech citizenship. He was, um, but somehow the family, the Dershowitz family here in America, and I don't know all the details, not important really uh, for this purpose, they somehow finessed the system and they managed to get visas to, for my parents. And when we went to Prague to the American embassy to get the visa, we had to keep it a secret. Uh, nobody knew about it. We had to kind of uh, be sure that nobody was following us, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, we got it and eventually uh, we left uh, Czechoslovakia on December 31, 1938 and went into what was at that particular moment, Poland, stayed there for a month and a half until we boarded the ship. Interesting. And what was the experience like on the ship? And I just want to make sure that, what was the... Oh, the ship was a regular, uh, I guess it was a tourist ship. The name was the MS Batory, B-A-T-O-R-Y, I remember that name. Oh, so it wasn't some refugee ship. You were on a nice on a nice, not a ship, right, not a refugee ship. Nobody knew. There were no, no refugees were allowed into America. There was no, uh, as a matter of fact, I can, you know, historically we know that there was some Jews on a ship and they were turned away back to Germany and they were slaughtered in Germany. America wouldn't let them in. Hmm. And how long did it take you to get to America? Well, I stayed in Poland. You see, Nobody knows this, very few people know that Poland took over part of Czechoslovakia at the time. They took advantage of uh, the Nazi threat to Czechoslovakia. So my grandparents were living in a town called Cieszyn, which was the Czech part of Cieszyn. But when I got there, it was Poland, <laughs> even though it had been Czechoslovakia. So we stayed with my grandparents for a month and a half, and then we boarded the ship uh, in February. And it took 11 days to get to America. We got here February 13, uh, 1939, and uh, Hitler took over Czechoslovakia 33 days later. And you mentioned seeing your grandparents before you left. Was that the last time you saw them? I didn't know it would be the last time, but now looking back, uh, it was the last time. I'll never forget the farewell, the goodbye. But the assumption in my childhood mind was that, okay, we'll see each other again. And that's very painful to talk about even now. I know. Sure. Well, I should ask, were there other Jews on the ship with you? Uh, there were. I, I couldn't tell you what religion they were. No. I saw people dancing at night. I saw music and a band, and it was a like a regular cruise ship and it must have been for wealthy people because in those days not a lot of people had money to go on a cruise ship. Um, okay, so uh, were you homesick at all? Did you miss your native country upon coming to the United States? And what were you looking forward to the most about coming to the United States? Well, see I had great support from my parents. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we were totally welcomed by the Dershowitz clan, I'll call them, who, were, who never met us before, who never knew us, not even on the telephone. There was no phone conversation. They just reached out to us 
And uh, when we arrived in Hoboken, New Jersey, there was a whole line of cars waiting for us to welcome us. So they, the, my cousins, and it, 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 it was like I was coming home. They were just so welcoming. I didn't speak a word of English. They spoke Yiddish, I spoke Yiddish. I really don't remember exactly how we communicated. Uh, but uh, I had to adjust to a new country, a new culture, a new language, and we did it because my parents were very positive and optimistic looking people. Fascinating. Now, I want to talk about so your incorporation into the United States. How did you feel when you first got to the United States? And for instance, was it a feeling of excitement, of sadness, or neither? Yeah, you see, uh, when I was a kid, I told you, you know. My parents sent me one summer to Yugoslavia. Uh, I had visited Poland. I had visited a few other countries. So for me, it was exciting to just be just at another place. And uh, the question was, uh, uh, what trolley car do I use to go where in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg? Is there a subway? How do you get across the Williamsburg Bridge to, to uh, you know, I mean, the challenge was this, with so, uh, the, the issue was that I didn't know how come we didn't hear from my grandparents. The, the issue was that there was no thought about picking up the phone and calling my former friends. You know, there was no such thing as international calls that, that we understand it today. So there was no such thought. The only question was, how come we don't hear? And then we heard, of course, that Hitler conquered uh, Czechoslovakia just 33 days after I arrived, so we knew that was out. And it was painful. It was painful. Yeah, I'm sure. But moving on to when you first lived in, that, in the United States, you mentioned your Dershowitz cousins and extended family took you in. Um, what was that like? How long were you living in their home? And when did, you, or when did you start living on your own as a family? My father was a very proud man. He had been a very successful businessman in Brno, where we lived, B-R-N-O, the city. And when we came here, we came with nothing in our pocket. But before we left, he knew that there'd be something to be done. So my mother, who had never worked in her life, and we had one or two maids in the house, went to work in Brno in uh, for a month in a chocolate making, candy making factory. They planned it all out because three days after we arrived here, my mother, my father found a tiny little apartment and my mother started making candy in the kitchen. And my father bought empty candy boxes. So right away, my father was a, uh, uh, just w would not rely on didn't want to ask anybody for help. He right away went to work uh, selling the candy that my mother made in the kitchen. We, we even had a kind of an extra room where we rented it out to other people uh, so they can pay the rent and uh, it went on from there. <coughs> Interesting, excuse me. For a Is that, by the way, they eventually then my father went and bought some ladies uh, uh, dresses and sold them together with the candy and made more money that way, door to door. Interesting. Now, did you feel like a stranger? Did your parents feel like a stranger? Were you received well by the general public? Well, I, w I did not feel like a stranger because I was surrounded by uh, those cousins. They called me the greener, a greenhorn. And that means a refugee. You know, I was the immigrant, the greener. There's no question about it. Did I, that make you feel like a, like uh, an outsider? Or was uh, it just a joke? Not really, because they said it with tongue in cheek, you know, with, with uh, in a welcoming sort of way. I was one of them, but you know, I was didn't speak their language. I'll tell you, uh, in those days on South 9th Street or South 10th Street in Williamsburg, traffic wasn't what it is today. We used to play uh, stickball uh, on the street. And I, the first time I ever saw somebody with a baseball glove, it's a huge glove on a hand, and I thought, you know, why? Is this guy's hand so swollen that he has to wear a huge glove? Never saw anything like that. So 
Baseball and things like that was strange to me, but they had me play ball too. So they integrated me, little by little. So you, you were received in that way, interesting. But what about your English and what about... Uh, I learned that from them and in the street. I never took an English class in my life. So first of all, can I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, so would you mind repeating that? But what about your English and did you, did you have an accent? Well, I can tell you one story. Uh, obviously I had an accent. I, I don't know if I have an accent today yet. But the story is that once, it, 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 I think it was PS 16, public school, where I went, it must have been about six, seven, nine months after I arrived here, uh, in, the, in the classroom they had a thing called, uh, that you got to give a one minute speech. Kids got up in front of the class and give, prepare, you know, the teacher to. And I, I didn't know, everybody else was talking about their favorite baseball star and this and that. I didn't know any of that, so I said, well, I'm going to give a speech on a day in Czechoslovakia. And I give, gave that speech, and the teacher said, well, how do you know all of that? I said, I was born there. She said, no, no, you, you, come on. And she was so upset at me that I was lying, and she gave me a D because I was lying. And I, uh, so... By that time, it seems that I didn't have an accent because otherwise what she would be saying to me, I was lying. It could be eight, nine, ten months later. I don't know exactly. You know, I didn't keep tabs of that. So I probably lost my accent very early. Interesting. All right. Well, in that, in that case, um, uh, did you ever hear your parents at least complain about not being welcomed or do you think they felt... You know, on the contrary, uh, my, my, my father, uh, after that first stint of door-to-door -door sales, found a, uh, uh, another business opportunities and this and that, and eventually opened his own business. He just went ahead. There was, I, I come from a family of optimists, and I still think I'm an optimist too, and uh, they just my mother went to work. She opened up a store, a knitting store, and was very, very creative and did su succeeded so much, even wrote instructions in English. You know, ladies came in, how do you knit this, this and that? So she wrote it out in English. And obviously, the, that was like one or two years into our stay in, 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 in our coming to America. And uh, my, my mother's uh, store was very successful, but my father was also so successful in business that he caused my mother to close the store. That's enough. Take care of the kids. But they both were working, and my sister and I, my sister came with us, obviously. She's two years my senior. My sister and I uh, just went to school, to regular school, and... Uh, I, I don't remember any negativity. I don't remember any anger at all. Okay, interesting. So it seems like they made it fairly well. So let me ask you this then. You are now almost 88 years old, as you mentioned before, 1928. You have lived uh, a, enough, a, a long time to, to see what modern immigrants are like. So what is the difference between you and your family when you guys were immigrants versus the immigrants of today, in your opinion? Well, I don't think there's such thing as all immigrants. There's some immigrants who uh, come with little or no education, and that's to their detriment. There's some immigrants who come with uh, considerable more immigrants. I don't think that anybody can make a statement about, quote, immigrants, end of quote. Every, every, every group of immigrants, every individual is altogether different. It also has to do with their attitude. Uh, right away, we started going to a little synagogue, and we had the support. There was a lot of faith involved. Uh, don't worry. Look, when I became bar mitzvah, I wanted a bicycle, and I remember the cost of the bicycle was $26. My father could not afford a bicycle, and so he put up $13, which was a lot of money for him, and my uncle, 
uh, on my, my mom's side, uh, put up another $13, and I was able to get a bar mitzvah gift of a $26 bicycle. That was it. The only other the party was six couples coming to my house after, after I was in the synagogue, and we had a little bit of wine and, and cake or something, and that was, the, that was the bar mitzvah party. I mean, that was it. But we, we had faith, we had optimism, and we just went ahead. We worked hard. My, my parents worked hard. And they saw to it that my sister and I got an education. That was the focus. And that's, that's nice. But let me tell you a statistic, and I want to hear what you say, because I don't want to generalize about immigrants. But I should tell you, 85% of modern-day immigrants are, uh, either come from Asia, Latin America, or the Caribbean. So let me just put it this way. And, and that means the majority of the modern-day immigrants are not Caucasian. They're not white. They don't look like you. They don't look, look necessarily. Well, they don't look like you. Do you think it's harder for them to integrate into American society because of this? That they're not. Well, happily, America is the country where uh, everybody who comes in uh, uh, properly or legally is certainly welcome, and the opportunity is for anybody. The equal. This is an equal opportunity country. Uh, by the way, even people who come in uh, not legally are welcome. Uh, they, they have a right, their kids have a right to go to school, uh, people uh, go to work. So it's a question of the initiative on the part of the individual who comes. Whether he, he's black, white, yellow, uh, whatever color, it doesn't matter. Uh, it has to do with his approach to want to be uh, successful and work hard at it. My father worked day and night. My mother worked day and night until things went, went fine. So uh, if anybody, uh, if the other people want to do the same, the opportunity in America is there, as far as I'm concerned. So what advice would you give to, does it, I don't want to generalize, but just any modern day immigrant, what advice would you say to him or her? Well, number one, uh, gratitude for being here. Number two, uh, rely on, uh, uh, on the society which is essentially welcoming to you. That doesn't mean there aren't, I mean there are anti-Semites also. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing. Uh, but there, there are people who hate blacks, there are people who hate uh, uh, Asians, there are people who hate Jews, but that should only stimulate them to do as much as they can to overcome that. There's never any perfection. Only Garden of Eden was perfect and we were thrown out of that perfect world. We're not in a perfect world. So we accept that, and we, instead of anger, use your energy to uh, do whatever you can to succeed. Interesting. So I, and you, in your career, I know, have actually done a lot to welcome people from foreign nations. Um, can you go and elaborate onto that? Well, I certainly am very sensitive to the fact that uh, uh, I was a stranger in a, in a welcoming land. And uh, to the extent that I was able to, uh, I saw to it that other people welcomed here as well. Whether they're Jews from Russia or Persian Jews, you know, Iranian Jews, or anybody else. And as you well know, uh, my wonderful wife, whom I miss a great deal, uh, was totally involved in interfaith work, whether it was with Muslims, a very good friend. An imam from a local mosque is a very good friend of of, of my wife. He was a guest at my house here on this couch. And uh, if it's Muslim and they're decent people, then we welcome them. I want to deal with decent people. I don't care what uh, uh, faith or religion there are, as long as they're decent. And, but then I didn't, not decent, I don't like them. Okay, so, and, but you, but do you not want to go into specifics about, about people you worked to ensure safety and security into this land? Um, but it, I won't say anything if you don't want me to go into specifics, but you know, when you work... Well, I mean, there, the Jews who came from Iran ran from a horrible persecution. They were, uh, they were very welcomed by the Shah of Iran. Not that all, uh, all uh, Iranian Jew Jewish history is good. There was a great deal of Jew hatred at one point, but in more recent times with the Shah, 
They were good, and then Khomeini came and hates Jews, so they ran. And uh, I was in a position to work with some congressmen and senators. And because when they came here, suddenly, uh, suddenly with no notice, came on a three or six months visa. And then they thought they were sure they were going to go back. It was only temporary after 2,000 years living there in that culture. They loved the culture. So after that, they were illegal. So I was in the position to work with senator and congressman and, and uh, got the Justice Department to make a declaration that if they can prove they're Jewish and they have an Iranian passport, they get uh, automatic political asylum. And that's the right thing to do, but it had to be done legally. I think that the, the, we are a nation of law and we have to follow the law and sometimes it takes a little effort, but we should do it. And I think, so now they, they were legal immigrants. And you're talking about our nation and law, and speaking of our nation, where do you think this nation is heading for the future? What's the trajectory for our country? No, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to discuss that. Okay. I uh, mean, that, how, how do I know? Okay, that's fair. The, the, so, uh, when you open up a TV set, you'll find a station, you'll find 15 uh, uh, opinions on that. Why should I uh, try to even project? That's fair. Okay. So let's move on then to our, our final um, section, which has to do with race and ethnicity identification. And I want to go back to your native country. Was race, did you even know about race when you were in, in Czechoslovakia? And, and how did you identify racially or ethnically? Well, I very strongly identified as a Jew. As a matter of fact, in Czechoslovakia, you had to register as a Jew with the government. You had to register as a Jew. So it's not only, it's, they made you do that. I mean, for positive purposes, I think, as far as I know. And uh, uh, I, I never met anybody in my childhood, as I recall, who was not white, because that was a white world then. Um, and then uh, only in America was I exposed to these things. Uh, uh. And then how did that change your mindset once you were exposed to other people who... No, you know, I, um, I, as a Jew I believe very strongly that uh, God made all of humanity and uh, it matters very little to me what color you are. It does matter to me whether your culture says uh, to hate other people or not. And I don't care whether you're white, black, or yellow, if you're good to other people, then I want to be good to you. If you're not good to other people, I'm going to resist you. Period. Look, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition, uh, there's a very important concept. Uh, why, if God made, uh, uh, in, in the story, 10,000 horses and 20,000 sheep and whatever, why did he make only one human being, Adam, so that nobody could say that my predecessor is better than yours? We all come from the same source, and we all have to treat each other equally. That's what Judaism teaches. But that's nice about, that's nice about Judaism. We're all from the same source. But, okay, but do you feel that it was easier for you to incorporate into American society because you were... Uh, a, a white. You know, I didn't incorporate into the society. My parents did. What do you mean? I mean, I, I lived with my parents. They taught me what I, what I'm supposed to uh, know, hopefully, and uh, there was never anything about anybody uh, uh, different or anything like that. There was no discussion about that. So, had you been, let's say, let's say, let's just throw out a uh, scenario that you had not been white and you had been another race. Do you think it would have been this, you would have had the same experiences in America and did you meet any immigrants who perhaps were not uh, white? Yes, and I, I mean, to answer your second question, of course I met people who are not white and uh, I see no reason why uh, society should not embrace them as they embraced everybody else. I had the benefit uh, being embraced by a very, very strong family situation, and we went from there. 
um, to the extent that they have family values, and whether you're black or, or uh, anything else, uh, you have to rely, first of all, on those people who are close to you. And uh, hopefully everybody has that support system uh, within each community, whether it's synagogue or church or mosque, they should uh, work hard to embrace the people in their culture because the people in their culture go to those places and that they feel, they feel easy in those places, they feel comfortable. A Catholic will feel more comfortable in a church than he does in a mosque or a synagogue. So let the church reach out as synagogues reach out to Jews and so on. And families should reach out to their families. Okay, interesting. And speaking of religion, let's segue into our, the final questions here. How did your immigrant experience affect your religious identity? And you haven't touched much on your career as a rabbi. So how did your, you didn't ask me? I know. I, <laughs> so how did it, how did how has it affected you over time? Well, I feel very strongly that I mean. If, if you live in a house and you have somebody in your house who's who in your home who needs help, you got to reach out to him. It doesn't mean that you ignore anybody else who needs help, but clearly the people who are close to you, you naturally have the uh, feeling of wanting to reach out to the people who are close to you. And by the way, if your house is shattered, very difficult to help anybody else. So you've got to have a secure home. Uh, but as a rabbi, I, wanna, I, I, I certainly want to reach out to fellow Jews. Maybe also I feel not a lot of people want to reach out to fellow Jews, to my fellow Jews. I mean, many, many do, I can tell you. Uh, even there's so many wonderful people of the Christian faith. There's even a Christian embassy in Jerusalem. People reach out to us that much. So there are a lot of people who reach out to us, but not everybody. But if we have to take care of our house first, but it doesn't mean only. And that's what I feel very strongly about. As a rabbi, I reach out to my people because of my community, but I better become involved in interfaith work as a Jew and, and reach out to other people, whether through organizations or one-on-one. -on -one. Well, what does Judaism uh, teach or say about immigrants, if anything? Well, I mean, uh, we're on the eve of Passover. Uh, <laughs> who more than Jews could say? It? As a matter of fact, I can tell you that in the Torah and the Bible, uh, at the time of the Exodus, there is a very interesting uh, thing to note that the Bible lists various commandments that we have to follow, not just the Ten Commandments. I mean, be, and. 36 times in the Bible it says, be good even to the Egyptians. We were enslaved to the Egyptians. No, be good to them, be good to every foreigner because some Egyptians came out of Egypt with the Israelites. And that commandment occurs more than any other single commandment in the Bible at the time of the Exodus. Be good to the stranger because you were stranger in Egypt, so you know how it's like. 36 times more than any other commandment, be good to the strangers. So what's the question? That's a fabulous answer. That was one of the best, I would say, sound bites uh, from this interview. I like I liked that a lot. Um, I think I'm just going to finish it off. I do have a few questions about Jews um, coming to the United States in modern era, but I don't want to. I don't want to generalize on on immigrants. But have you met modern day Jewish immigrants? Just quickly before we move on to the final question. Very often, very uh, in very many different situations, and uh, you know the the question is how we can how we can help each other, how we can help them. After all, I'm very grateful because my family and I were helped tremendously and succeeded, um, came with nothing. I mean, my, my father could not take anything with, us, with me except some suitcases. I mean, how, what can you take? And we, we started with absolutely nothing. 
uh, and, uh, and we succeeded because we had a great support, but also a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, there was education, there was uh, a lot of optimism, and there was a lot of faith. And you, no one thing does it for you. And by the way, I would assume some luck as well, but, uh, you know, my father was a very hard-working man, and, uh, but he never let my sister or I uh, have any feeling of depression or anger. He brought us up, no, you have to be grateful for what you have. Uh, uh, and he said, Baruch uh, uh, Yom Yom. Thank God every single day. That was his phrase every morning. Thank God every day for what you got. And as we conclude, looking back on all your years here in America, what, what do you uh, think about this country? How is this... Uh, country uh, helped you in your life and um, just overall are you thankful to be here still? Well that's putting it mildly I mean I'm if it wasn't for America I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't be alive but beside that the question of not just life but a good life and uh, look there are challenges there are many uh, ups and downs especially in a democratic society when people are allowed to, uh, to differ with you. And, uh, and I feel the differences sometimes. I feel some of them are totally incongruous and improper, but it's a democratic society. I'll never forget there was a time, I think, near Chicago, many, many years ago, where some Nazis were, this is after the war, were parading, and we, people were angry, but it, no freedom of speech but the freedom of speech has to be on both sides I'm upset that there are people uh, who who disturb uh, pro-israel speakers at universities for example uh, the, and and uh, the, 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 somehow they're not allowed to express themselves uh, people disturb them in university settings and and uh, I think that's terrible Freedom of speech means freedom of speech, and you have to work it on both sides. And it's a, it's a good country to live in, let me tell you. Uh, I don't know of any other place that has so many opportunities for so many people. Any final uh, remarks you would like to add? Any final things you would like to add about this country or about anything before we conclude? Well, yeah, we, we have to... Uh, we have to have a deep sense of appreciation for, uh, uh, for for the forefathers of America, how they created this country. They created it in a, at times when freedom was really not uh, not uh, the popular thing to do. I'll never forget the story of uh, uh, Peter Stuyvesant in what was then New Amsterdam when he try to turn away Jews who, who migrated there, just a, f a small, tiny little group. And then it was the uh, Dutch East India Company where there were Jews involved, told them, hey, Peter, if you're going to turn away these Jews, we're going to fire you. So Jews were welcomed by Peter Stuyvesant. And uh, that was one of, the, one of the many beginnings of Jewish uh, freedom in, in America. And I hope it's that true for everybody, whether you're Jewish or black or white or whatever faith, or even an atheist, you know, it's free. That's what counts.